So I think that anyone with a functioning brain realizes that Bernie Sanders is now the Democratic Party primary frontrunner. And this is by all objective measures. Not what I say, but what the data says. He got the most votes in Iowa and New Hampshire. He's projected by 538 to dominate on Super Tuesday. He took the lead nationally. A new Monmouth poll finds that he has the most support among non-white voters. He made a 10-point gain just with African-American voters. So he's a frontrunner. Although pundits on mainstream media, since they don't want that to be the case, they're having cognitive dissonance. And it's interesting because we're watching them react in real time and they are just embarrassing themselves. They don't want to acknowledge the fact that Bernie Sanders is now the front runner. So they're trying to twist themselves into logical pretzels uh, by finding ways to rationalize why he's not the front runner. And it's just downright embarrassing. So Chuck Todd of MSNBC, he decided to uh, voice how he just can't fathom why anyone would view Bernie as the front runner. I mean, look at his 2016 numbers and compare them to 2020. The percentages are way lower. So how could he be the front runner? I, I don't understand how Bernie is considered a front runner. This is a guy that had more, you know, more people showed up to the polls. Highest turnout ever, and his percentage went down, not up. Yeah. His total number went down, not up. And new voters actually voted for Buttigieg and Klobuchar. Because 2016 was a two-person race, and 2020 is a 10-person race. As more candidates enter the equation, percentages decrease. Of course, he'd do better in a two-way race than he would in a 10-way race. Like, I shouldn't have to explain this to someone who gets paid probably millions of dollars every single year to do news and inform people. But the fact that I do is a little worrisome to say the least. And I wish I could tell you that Chuck Todd was the only person to make the same case, but he's not. On MSNBC, Lawrence O'Donnell also said, well, look, his 2016 numbers were, were way higher and he still didn't win the primary. So how is he the front runner now? If Bernie Sanders though, doesn't run away with it, isn't this, well, I mean, he hasn't running, even- let, look, He can't run away with it. Look, last time, Four years ago, sitting right here, uh, Bernie Sanders won 60% of the vote. We were sitting here and it came in at 60%. He's going to get half that if he's lucky tonight. And by the way, when he won 60% of the vote last year in New Hampshire, that was not enough of a launching pad to actually win the nomination. So the story of the Sanders campaign so far this year is how much ground he's lost from four years ago. He's lost half of the support in New Hampshire. He's lost half of his support nationwide. He, he he ran at 49% against Hillary Clinton nationwide last time. He's running about 25% nationwide. So all that support has gone to other people. Uh, and so it is very difficult right now to see what the route is to winning the nomination through the primaries at this point for any candidate. That route has not yet emerged. It could. It could easily emerge. Are but you as of now, it's not there. This is embarrassing, and their desperation is so apparent. Even if you don't have the same critiques of mainstream media as myself or anyone who watches this program, like it is painfully obvious that he's trying to gaslight people. He's trying to spin this. But look, spin is nothing more than spin. We can spin it too. As Eyeball Slicer pointed out on Twitter, if we spin it our way, it looks like Bernie Sanders actually made huge gains because if you base the New Hampshire primary on the number of candidates defeated, well, I mean, in 2016, he only defeated one candidate and this time he defeated nine candidates. So, I mean, look, we can play the spin game too, except what if, rather than spinning it that way, we take all of the candidates who are not Bernie Sanders or at a minimum, the moderates and add them together. That's also what they're saying. Uh, Chris Matthews pointed this out. This situation, so I'm a bit fr frustrated and I'm not the answer to all questions. Brian, Brian and Rachel, I'm just not tonight. I'm a little frustrated because I don't know what this, it was a victory, a win's a win, as you say at the New York Giants, New York football Giants, yes. <laughs> but it wasn't the victory of a guy that got 60% last time. And Buttigieg and Klobuchar together trounced Bernie tonight. And on top of that, there's this beautiful graphic. I don't know where it came from, maybe MSNBC. But uh, as you can see, if you add up Joe Biden, Amy Klobuchar, and Pete Buttigieg arbitrarily, I don't know why they chose just these three, then they clearly are in the lead and they have a gigantic lead over Bernie Sanders. <laughs>
And I couldn't find the clip for this one, but Sean King tweeted about it. He says, on MSNBC, they just announced that Bernie Sanders has taken a big lead in New Hampshire, but the panelists then started saying that even though he's in first, that if you add up Pete and Amy together, that they're in first. That's not actually how elections work. (laughs) But still, they're trying so hard. Look, if we take Pete and Amy and we fuse them into one human being in the same way that Goku and Vegeta were fused into Vegito, or Trunks and Gotem were fused into Gotenks to beat Majin Buu, of course, then maybe they'd have a chance. I mean, that's just my thinking. So if we make them into one person and maybe maybe even add Biden into the equation, maybe they would be powerful enough to take on Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's what we have uh, reached. That's the level of delusion that we are at. We're in fantasy land. Like, of course, if you add up the other candidates, collectively, they'd have a higher percentage than Bernie Sanders. But he has the most votes. He's winning. Do you understand? Like, he is winning. He got first place in the number of votes in Iowa and New Hampshire. That's how we choose winners. But I digress because they also, rather than, you know, dwelling on Bernie Sanders um, getting first place, before we found out the results, they already anticipated that Bernie would win and they tried to spin it. So that way, third place was more important than first place. And I really wish I was kidding about this, but I'm not. The real thing that I'm looking for tonight is, of course, that key third place finish, um, which we were just talking about there in the break. Amy Klobuchar, the momentum is on her side. This would be a huge, huge victory for Amy. In fact, I would almost argue that a third place finish for Amy would be stronger and more important than a first place finish for Bernie. I mean, of course it would. That key third place finish is really what everyone strives for. (laughs) I don't... I don't know how to respond to this. These people are respected by a large portion of the American population. They are tasked with the duty of informing the electorate. And they're saying that third place is actually more important. Now, can you focus on the gains that Amy Klobuchar made, to be fair? Sure. But to say that that's more important than getting first place... I don't like there are no words to explain that level of absurdity. What we are seeing is cognitive dissonance. They don't want Bernie to be the nominee. They don't want him to be the front runner and they don't want to admit it. So what they're doing is making themselves look ridiculous in an attempt to downplay his victory. And even if you don't buy the third place narrative, maybe you'll find this one from Obama alum Jim Messina more persuasive because he concludes that a lot of New Hampshire voters backed moderates. So the big winner last night could be Mayor Bloomberg. So do you understand how they're trying to finesse and mold the data and move the goalpost? At first, it's third place that's more important. But now, you know, the person who wasn't even in this race He actually did the best. Not the person who won, but the person who wasn't even on the ballot, literally. He's the winner, possibly. I mean, what a joke. But when they're not trying to finesse the results, if you will, then they're just outright lying about Bernie Sanders, as Fox News would. And casually so, mind you. This is clearly a fight for... To be the alternative to Bernie Sanders, yeah. right? If you've got Bernie Sanders kind of sailing through Iowa, looking to do well here, it's which of these three, Biden, Buttigieg, Klobuchar, can consolidate the rest of this field, if it's possible at all. Does this essentially pave the way, this this infighting, for Buttigieg to be that, uh, that alternative, leaving the Democratic Party with two candidates who have shown no ability to appeal to people of color? You're wrong. That, kids, is what we'd call an alternative fact. Because Bernie Sanders received the most votes from non-white voters in both Iowa and New Hampshire, and according to a Monmouth poll, he is now in the lead among non-white voters. I repeat, he is in the lead and just made a 10-point gain among voters of color. So what that pundit told you was a bold-faced lie. Lying through their teeth because they don't want to admit that Bernie Sanders is doing well. Now, Chris Matthews, getting back to him, took a different approach. Rather than just straight up lying or fear-mongering about, you know, execution squads in Central Park, he chose to try to reason with voters and get them to see why Amy Klobuchar really is a great candidate. Why? Because she's so joyful. The Democratic Party is clearly divided between left and center-left. Clearly, we all know that. And the candidates fill those roles. 
Bernie fills the one in the progressive left, clearly. But who's going to be his challenger in the center? Who's going to be that person? Are you going to have to wait for Mike Bloomberg to show up with all his billions or not? Now, Klobuchar is winning in a number of those categories tonight in our exit polling. She is leading what I think is the most important category. Who can not just win the election, but unite the country in a matter of days, Friday night to Tuesday morning, she did it. She showed with audacity you can jump out there and become a hero. And by the way, Democrats fall in love. And I think in her that tonight we all agree there's some joy there. Bernie indicts. The weaknesses of American economic life mainly, the weaknesses in terms of our health care system, the evils he sees in the, in the fossil fuel industry, and all those kinds of things, they're indictments. They're not happy. They're not joyous. She finds a way to care about the problem in a positive, empathetic way. And I think that empathy is something that Democrats need. Yes, because the lady who abuses her staff and tells voters she's going to do jack shit for them is the individual who's the most joyful and has the most empathy. <laughs> It's like we are living in the twilight zone. This is where we're at. They hate Bernie Sanders so much that they are throwing everything at the wall with hopes that something will stick that we will grab onto and get us to move away from Bernie Sanders. And, you know, judging by the look on Chris Matthews' face right now, I get it. He's scared right now, but he's not alone because our good friend James Carville endorsed Michael Bennett in hopes that, you know, that would give him a much needed boost because maybe Michael Bennett is better than the other thousand centrists in the race. But I mean, he dropped out right after New Hampshire. So if nothing is working and they've tried everything, this leaves us with a very important question. And I'll let Jennifer Rubin of The Washington Post ask it. So who's going to stop Bernie? Please, 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 somebody save us from Bernie Sanders. He wants to raise the minimum wage, legalize marijuana, and give people health care. Can you imagine? I don't want to live in that kind of a country. What are we, Canada? They're begging, and they're pleading with us. And I'm not being hyperbolic. As Max Boot asks... Please, Democrats, do the smart thing and coalesce quickly around one of the three moderates, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, or Michael Bloomberg, who are still standing after the first two contests. The future of our democracy may depend on it. Now, I find it hilariously ironic that he claims to be concerned about democracy, as he openly wishes that one of the Democrats that the party coalesces around is Michael Bloomberg, a literal oligarch who's trying to buy his way into the White House. But yet, go democracy. I care about democracy. Let's let him buy the election, though. All to stop Bernie. These people are so fucking dumb that when I watch mainstream media, like if I tune in for longer than 20 minutes, I feel like my head is going to explode. <laughs> and it's like, I laugh, but really it's it's not funny. But you have to laugh to keep yourself from raging because if I wasn't able to channel what they do to the country, then I would like snap this iPad in half and throw it across the room because I mean, this really is harmful. We laugh at it, I laugh at it, but what they're doing is they are brainwashing an entire country all because they want their tax cuts to remain intact and because they work at MSNBC and they probably tell them, don't say anything nice about Bernie Sanders, we have to defeat him. I don't know what's going on in production meetings, but I mean, it's evident that there is this coordinated effort at MSNBC to stop Bernie Sanders. If you tuned in to election night coverage in New Hampshire, it was just craven. It was insane. I don't know how else to describe it. It was worse than Fox News. Like, they're getting worse than Fox News. Fox News is more fair to Bernie Sanders than the so-called liberal network. Like, do you understand? Like, this is insane. This is insane. And going back to that clip of Chris Matthews, it's funny because he openly wondered who is going to be the one to save us from Bernie Sanders. Um, could it be Pete? Could it be Amy? Can they save us now? Or do we have to wait for Mike Bloomberg to show up? So, I mean, they're really betting a lot on Mike Bloomberg and they're not criticizing him in the way that they should a presidential candidate. Now, maybe it's just me, but I know that he's spending hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising, which benefits MSNBC. So maybe that's part of the reason why. I don't know what it is, but you can now see them pretty explicitly trying to nudge you in the direction of Michael Bloomberg. In fact, that's what Joy Reid did. And she explained, after years, mind you, to give you some context, that Bernie Sanders isn't a Democrat, that Mike Bloomberg might be the best bet for Democrats, 
because he's a Republican. He's got a lot of potential to have black elected officials, and you see them coming forward because he's actually put his money where his mouth is on those liberal causes. On the other hand, he did the two things that really go together, which is gentrification and stop and frisk in New York, so that when you're gentrifying a neighborhood in Brooklyn, now the new people who move in, the rich people, are afraid of the old people that were there, that were in the projects in Fort Greene, and then you start stop and frisk, and it's intense, and he's been defending it right up until last year. He defended um, the, the crime bill, and he said, I don't understand why Joe Biden is embarrassed about being white. Why is he apologizing for being white? So he still sounds like a Republican to a lot of people. So it's a weird coalition, but I gotta tell you, if this is an exhaustion election, which I think it is, an exhaustion election means people just want to sleep at night. It I don't means... know what you're talking about. <laughs> Coming from someone with severe insomnia, they're saying that Trump is exhausting. So even, and I, you know, I know Republicans who, they don't mind the fiscal policies of Trump. Right. They like that, but they also want to sleep at night. Right. So if you're a Republican and you still want Republican policy, but you don't want the tweets and the madness, you might go to him. If you're a Democrat that just wants to beat Trump at all costs, mm -hmm. When you see Trump as just this force of, of, of evil, and you just want the money that it's going to take to defeat him, and you think this guy will spend $2 billion to beat him, I, you might vote And for him. I think the, something I pick up anecdotally is you want the guy that's going to fight high and low. Yeah. I mean, there is something, and, and, and it's, it's a, this is a compliment, not an insult to Democrats. They follow the rules. Absolutely. They follow the rules. And with Trump, you can't beat him by following the rules right. because he cheats at everything. He, yeah. he asked Ukraine to help him. You know, be, yeah. I mean, he cheats at everything. And there is a sense with Bloomberg, not that he'll break any rules, but that he'll go high and he'll go low. He well, talked about, you know, porn and yep. a cheeseburger and a putter being in his brain. That yep. was our friend Tim O'Brien, too. And you cannot beat Trump unless you hit him where it hurts. And the bottom line is, number one, you can't beat showbiz without showbiz. And Democrats don't understand showbiz, even though all of showbiz is on their side <laughs> in Hollywood, but they don't understand showbiz. And the and the other reality is, if you want a Democrat to win, they, they have to know how to fight like a Republican. That's right. He's a Republican. He used to go anyway. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we just run Mitt Romney? In fact, fuck it. Let's just run Donald Trump like we are reaching onion article territory with the suggestions here. Let's run a Republican because Democratic Party voters definitely want to vote for a Republican more than a Democrat. I just, I don't know what to say. And again, I can't stress this enough. The fact that all of these pundits are being extra kind to Mike Bloomberg after he's spending money to advertise is a scandal in and of itself. Like him buying the election or trying to buy the election, that's a scandal. But the fact that pundits are obviously falling in line and not criticizing him, that is something that we need to pay attention to as well. This is how manufacturing consent works. Now, because we all just tortured ourselves watching those awful clips from these lunatics who think that they know better, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, a chaser, something to cleanse the palate, something that's actually surprisingly delightful to see from mainstream media. Van Jones on CNN did what seemingly no other pundit did. Bernie Sanders is a phenomenon. He, he is, it, it, he doesn't get any attention, people don't talk about him, he just continues to rack up these big, big uh, uh, numbers, these big margins, and he's doing stuff that we don't talk about enough. He's appealing to young people, and people of color, increasingly, and women, and the beer track voters that you know, people talk about for Biden, he, they're showing up for Bernie Sanders. He's got an army of unbelievable uh, donors. If anybody else had all that, we'd be saying, this guy's our guy. For whatever reason, we continue to talk about everybody with Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I wonder why that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, all I've got to say is this is only the beginning. Like, think about if we wake up the next day after Super Tuesday and Bernie Sanders really does dominate in the way that 538 is projecting he will dom dominate. All of that crime that we saw will be 10 times worse. And at this point, they're so brazen and trying to erase Bernie Sanders. I don't even know that the mainstream media will tell us that he won Super Tuesday if he does. I mean, look at this headline on Twitter from Reuters. They don't even say that Bernie Sanders won. I mean, they're so obvious, so obvious. They hate Bernie Sanders. They want to stop him at all costs. And no matter how well Bernie Sanders performs, they're already cooking up narratives to spin it. I guarantee it right now. They're already working on what to say after Super Tuesday. They're already working on what to say after the Democratic Convention. They're already working on what to say on November 4th after he wins the election. That's what they're working on. They have all of this pre-planned because they just can't allow Bernie Sanders to win because they are 
pro-corporate propagandists. And that's never going to change. It doesn't matter who's elected president. So what we have to do is make sure that we don't prop them up. We don't give them our views and we support indie media. If it's not going to be this show, support a different show. Because all I know is that if corporate media were the ones who exclusively covered elections and we had no other alternative sources, I mean, could you imagine? Mike Bloomberg would probably just cruise through the nomination. The Humanist Report is fake news. Mike only cares about Crazy Bernie and his wacky socialist ideas. Sad, very sad. I'm unsubscribing.